Enzymes are large biological molecules responsible for the thousands of metabolic processes that sustain life. They are highly selective catalysts, greatly accelerating both the rate and specificity of metabolic reactions, from the digestion of food to the synthesis of DNA. Most enzymes are proteins, although some catalytic RNA molecules have been identified. Enzymes adopt a specific three-dimensional structure, and may employ organic and inorganic cofactors to assist in catalysis. In enzymatic reactions, the molecules at the beginning of the process, called substrates, are converted into different molecules, called products. Almost all chemical reactions in a biological cell need enzymes in order to occur at rates sufficient for life. Since enzymes are selective for their substrates and speed up only a few reactions from among many possibilities, the set of enzymes made in a cell determines which metabolic pathways occur in that cell. Like all catalysts, enzymes work by lowering the activation energy for a reaction, thus dramatically increasing the rate of the reaction. As a result, products are formed faster and reactions reach their equilibrium state more rapidly. Most enzyme reaction rates are millions of times faster than those of comparable uncatalyzed reactions. As with all catalysts, enzymes are not consumed by the reactions they catalyze, nor do they alter the equilibrium of these reactions. However, enzymes do differ from most other catalysts in that they are highly specific for their substrates. Enzymes are known to catalyze about 4,000 biochemical reactions. A few RNA molecules called ribozymes also catalyze reactions, with an important example being some parts of the ribosome. Synthetic molecules called artificial enzymes also display enzyme-like catalysis. Enzyme activity can be affected by other molecules. Inhibitors are molecules that decrease enzyme activity. Activators are molecules that increase activity. Many drugs and poisons are enzyme inhibitors. Activity is also affected by temperature, pressure, chemical environment, and the concentration of substrate. Some enzymes are used commercially, for example, in the synthesis of antibiotics. In addition, some household products use enzymes to speed up biochemical reactions. Etymology and History As early as the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the digestion of meat by stomach secretions and the conversion of starch to sugars by plant extracts and saliva were known. However, the mechanism by which this occurred had not been identified. In 1833, French chemist and Sempern discovered the first enzyme, diastase. A few decades later, when studying the fermentation of sugar to alcohol by yeast, Louis Pasteur came to the conclusion that this fermentation was catalyzed by a vital force contained within the yeast cells called ferments, which were thought to function only within living organisms. He wrote that alcoholic fermentation is an act correlated with the life and organization of the yeast cells, not with the death or putrefaction of the cells. In 1877, German physiologist Wilhelm Karl I. Quarter HNE first used the term enzyme, which comes from Greek a one quarter i one half i paragraph i one quarter i i one half leavened to describe this process. The word enzyme was used later to refer to non-living substances such as pepsin, and the word ferment was used to refer to chemical activity produced by living organisms. In 1897, Duard Buchner submitted his first paper on the ability of yeast extracts that lacked any living yeast cells to ferment sugar. In a series of experiments at the University of Berlin, he found that the sugar was fermented even when there were no living yeast cells in the mixture. He named the enzyme that brought about the fermentation of sucrose zymase. In 1907, he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his biochemical research and his discovery of cell-free fermentation. Following Buchner's example, enzymes are usually named according to the reaction they carry out. Typically, to generate the name of an enzyme, the suffix ace is added to the name of its substrate or the type of reaction. Having shown that enzymes could function outside a living cell, the next step was to determine their biochemical nature. Many early workers noted that enzymatic activity was associated with proteins, but several scientists argued that proteins were merely carriers for the true enzymes and that proteins per se were incapable of catalysis. However, in 1926, J. 
James B. Sumner showed that the enzyme urease was a pure protein and crystallized it. Sumner did likewise for the enzyme catalase in 1937. The conclusion that pure proteins can be enzymes was definitively proved by Northrop and Stanley, who worked on the digestive enzymes pepsin, trypsin and chymotrypsin. These three scientists were awarded the 1946 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. This discovery that enzymes could be crystallized eventually allowed their structures to be solved by X-ray crystallography. This was first done for lysozyme, an enzyme found in tears, saliva and egg whites that digest the coating of some bacteria. The structure was solved by a group led by David Chilton Phillips and published in 1965. This high-resolution structure of lysozyme marked the beginning of the field of structural biology and the effort to understand how enzymes work at an atomic level of detail. Structures and Mechanisms Enzymes are in general globular proteins and range from just 62 amino acid residues in size, for the monomer of 4-oxalic rotinate tautomerase, to over 2,500 residues in the animal fatty acid synthase. A small number of RNA-based biological catalysts exist, with the most common being the ribosome. These are referred to as either RNA enzymes or ribozymes. The activities of enzymes are determined by their three-dimensional structure. However, although structure does determine function, predicting a novel enzyme's activity just from its structure is a very difficult problem that has not yet been solved. Most enzymes are much larger than the substrates they act on, and only a small portion of the enzyme is directly involved in catalysis. The region that contains these catalytic residues, binds the substrate, and then carries out the reaction is known as the active site. Enzymes can also contain sites that bind cofactors, which are needed for catalysis. Some enzymes also have binding sites for small molecules, which are often direct or indirect products or substrates of the reaction catalyzed. This binding can serve to increase or decrease the enzyme's activity, providing a means for feedback regulation. Like all proteins, enzymes are long, linear chains of amino acids that fold to produce a three-dimensional product. Each unique amino acid sequence produces a specific structure, which has unique properties. Individual protein chains may sometimes group together to form a protein complex. Most enzymes can be denaturated a euro that is, unfolded and inactivated a euro by heating or chemical denaturants, which disrupt the three-dimensional structure of the protein. Depending on the enzyme, denaturation may be reversible or irreversible. Structures of enzymes with substrates or substrate analogues during a reaction may be obtained using time-resolved crystallography methods. Specificity Enzymes are usually very specific as to which reactions they catalyze and the substrates that are involved in these reactions. Complementary shape Charge and hydrophilic hydrophobic characteristics of enzymes and substrates are responsible for this specificity. Enzymes can also show impressive levels of stereospecificity, regioselectivity and chemoselectivity. Some of the enzymes showing the highest specificity and accuracy are involved in the copying and expression of the genome. These enzymes have proofreading mechanisms. Here, an enzyme such as DNA polymerase catalyzes a reaction in a first step and then checks that the product is correct in a second step. This two-step process results in average error rates of less than one error in 100 million reactions in high-fidelity mammalian polymerases. Similar proofreading mechanisms are also found in RNA polymerase, aminosyl tRNA synthesis and ribosomes. Whereas some enzymes have broad specificity, as they can act on a relatively broad range of different physiologically relevant substrates, many enzymes possess small side activities which arose fortuitously, which may be the starting point for the evolutionary selection of a new function. This phenomenon is known as enzyme promiscuity. Lock and key model, enzymes are very specific, and it was suggested by Emil Fischer in 1894 that this was because both the enzyme and the substrate possess specific complementary geometric shapes that fit exactly into one another. This is often referred to as the lock and key model. However, while this model explains enzyme specificity, it fails to explain the stabilization of the transition state that enzymes achieve. In 1958, 
Daniel Koshlin suggested a modification to the lock and key model, since enzymes are rather flexible structures, the active site is continuously reshaped by interactions with the substrate as the substrate interacts with the enzyme. As a result, the substrate does not simply bind to a rigid active site. The amino acid side chains that make up the active site are molded into the precise positions that enable the enzyme to perform its catalytic function. In some cases, such as glycosidases, the substrate molecule also changes shape slightly as it enters the active site. The active site continues to change until the substrate is completely bound, at which point the final shape and charge is determined. Induced fit may enhance the fidelity of molecular recognition in the presence of competition and noise via the conformational proofreading mechanism. Based on Fisher's lock and key model and Koshlander Euro unregistered trademark S induced fit theory, the Chower Euro unregistered trademark S distorted key theory for peptide drugs was proposed to develop peptide drugs against HIV AIDS and SARS. Mechanisms Enzymes can act in several ways, all of which lower IGAR Euro, lowering the activation energy by creating an environment in which the transition state is stabilized into their transition state form thereby reducing the amount of energy required to complete the transition. Lowering the energy of the transition state, but without distorting the substrate, by creating an environment with the opposite charge distribution to that of the transition state. Providing an alternative pathway. For example, temporarily reacting with the substrate to form an intermediate ES complex, which would be impossible in the absence of the enzyme. Reducing the reaction entropy change by bringing substrates together in the correct orientation to react. Considering I high gyro alone overlooks this effect. Increases in temperatures speed up reactions. Thus, temperature increases help the enzyme function and develop the end product even faster. However, if heated too much, the enzyme's shape deteriorates and the enzyme becomes denatured. Some enzymes like Mullabal enzymes work best at low temperatures. The function of a protein is dependent on its structure so that if the structure is disrupted, so is its function. It is interesting that this entropic effect involves destabilization of the ground state, and its contribution to catalysis is relatively small. Transition state stabilization the understanding of the origin of the reduction of IGAR Euro requires one to find out how the enzymes can stabilize its transition state more than the transition state of the uncatalyzed reaction. It seems that the most effective way for reaching large stabilization is the use of electrostatic effects, in particular, when having a relatively fixed polar environment that is oriented towards the charge distribution of the transition state. Such an environment does not exist in the uncatalyzed reaction in water. Dynamics and function The internal dynamics of enzymes has been suggested to be linked with their mechanism of catalysis. Internal dynamics are the movement of parts of the enzyme's structure, such as individual amino acid residues, a group of amino acids, or even an entire protein domain. These movements occur at various time scales ranging from femtoseconds to seconds. Networks of protein residues throughout an enzyme structure can contribute to catalysis through dynamic motions. This is simply seen in the kinetic scheme of the combined process, enzymatic activity and dynamics. This scheme can have several independent michaelis menten like reaction pathways that are connected through fluctuation rates. Protein motions are vital to many enzymes, but whether small and fast vibrations, or larger and slower conformational movements are more important depends on the type of reaction involved. However, although these movements are important in binding and releasing substrates and products, it is not clear if protein movements help to accelerate the chemical steps in enzymatic reactions. These new insights also have implications in understanding allostric effects and developing new medicines. Allostric modulation Allostric sites are sites on the enzyme that bind to molecules in the cellular environment. The sites form weak, non-covalent bonds with these molecules, causing a change in the conformation of the enzyme. This change in conformation translates to the active site, which then affects the reaction rate of the enzyme. Allostric interactions can both inhibit and activate enzymes and are a common way that enzymes are controlled in the body. 
cofactors and coenzymes. Cofactors, some enzymes do not need any additional components to show full activity. However, others require non-protein molecules called cofactors to be bound for activity. Cofactors can be either inorganic or organic compounds. Organic cofactors can be either prosthetic groups, which are tightly bound to an enzyme, or coenzymes, which are released from the enzyme's active site during the reaction. Coenzymes include NADH, NADPH and adenosine triphosphate. These molecules transfer chemical groups between enzymes. An example of an enzyme that contains a cofactor is carbonic anhydrase, and is shown in the ribbon diagram above with a zinc cofactor bound as part of its active site. These tightly bound molecules are usually found in the active site and are involved in catalysis. For example, flavin and heme cofactors are often involved in redox reactions. Enzymes that require a cofactor but do not have one bound are called apoenzymes or apoproteins. An apoenzyme together with its cofactor, S, is called a holoenzyme. Most cofactors are not covalently attached to an enzyme, but are very tightly bound. However, organic prosthetic groups can be covalently bound. The term holoenzyme can also be applied to enzymes that contain multiple protein subunits, such as the DNA polymerases. Here the holoenzyme is the complete complex containing all the subunits needed for activity. Coenzymes Coenzymes are small organic molecules that can be loosely or tightly bound to an enzyme. Tightly bound coenzymes can be called prosthetic groups. Coenzymes transport chemical groups from one enzyme to another. Some of these chemicals such as riboflavin, thiamine and folic acid are vitamins. The chemical groups carried include the hydride ion carried by NAD or NADP+, the phosphate group carried by adenosine triphosphate, the acetyl group carried by coenzyme A, formyl, methanol or methyl groups carried by folic acid and the methyl group carried by S-adenosylmethanine. Since coenzymes are chemically changed as a consequence of enzyme action, it is useful to consider coenzymes to be a special class of substrates, or second substrates, which are common to many different enzymes. For example, about 700 enzymes are known to use the coenzyme NADH. Coenzymes are usually continuously regenerated and their concentrations maintained at a steady level inside the cell, for example, NADPH is regenerated through the pentose phosphate pathway and S adenosylmethanine by methanine adenosyl transferase. This continuous regeneration means that even small amounts of coenzymes are used very intensively. For example, the human body turns over its own weight in ATP each day. Thermodynamics As all catalysts, enzymes do not alter the position of the chemical equilibrium of the reaction. Usually, in the presence of an enzyme, the reaction runs in the same direction as it would without the enzyme, just more quickly. However, in the absence of the enzyme, other possible uncatalyzed, spontaneous reactions might lead to different products, because in those conditions this different product is formed faster. Furthermore, enzymes can couple two or more reactions, so that a thermodynamically favorable reaction can be used to drive a thermodynamically unfavorable one. For example, the hydrolysis of ATP is often used to drive other chemical reactions. Enzymes catalyze the forward and backward reactions equally. They do not alter the equilibrium itself, but only the speed at which it is reached. For example, carbonic anhydrase catalyzes its reaction in either direction depending on the concentration of its reactants. Nevertheless, if the equilibrium is greatly displaced in one direction, that is, in a very exergonic reaction, the reaction is in effect irreversible. Under these conditions, the enzyme will, in fact, catalyze the reaction only in the thermodynamically allowed direction. Kinetics Enzyme kinetics is the investigation of how enzymes bind substrates and turn them into products. The rate data used in kinetic analyses are commonly obtained from enzyme assays, where since the 90s, the dynamics of many enzymes are studied on the level of individual molecules. In 1902 Victor Henry proposed a quantitative theory of enzyme kinetics, but his experimental data were not useful because the significance of the hydrogen ion concentration was not yet appreciated. 
after Peter Loritz R. Rensen had defined the logarithmic pH scale and introduced the concept of buffering in 1909 the German chemist Leonor Michaelis and his Canadian postdoc Maud Len Rementon repeated Henri's experiments and confirmed his equation, which is referred to as Henri Michaelis' Menten kinetics. Their work was further developed by G. E. Briggs and J. B. S. Haldane, who derived kinetic equations that are still widely considered today a starting point in solving enzymatic activity. The major contribution of Henri was to think of enzyme reactions in two stages. In the first, the substrate binds reversibly to the enzyme, forming the enzyme substrate complex. This is sometimes called the Michaelis complex. The enzyme then catalyzes the chemical step in the reaction and releases the product. Note that the simple Michaelis Menten mechanism for the enzymatic activity is considered today a basic idea, where many examples show that the enzymatic activity involves structural dynamics. This is incorporated in the enzymatic mechanism while introducing several Michaelis Menten pathways that are connected with fluctuating rates. Nevertheless, there is a mathematical relation connecting the behavior obtained from the basic Michaelis Menten mechanism with the generalized Michaelis Menten mechanisms involving dynamics and activity. This means that the measured activity of enzymes on the level of many enzymes may be explained with the simple Michaelis Menten equation, yet, the actual activity of enzymes is richer and involves structural dynamics. Enzymes can catalyze up to several million reactions per second. For example, the uncatalyzed decarboxylation of orotidine 5-monophosphate has a half-life of 78 million years. However, when the enzyme orotidine 5-phosphate decarboxylase is added, the same process takes just 25 milliseconds. Enzyme rates depend on solution conditions and substrate concentration. Conditions that denature the protein abolish enzyme activity, such as high temperatures, extremes of pH or high salt concentrations, while raising substrate concentration tends to increase activity when, S, is low. To find the maximum speed of an enzymatic reaction, the substrate concentration is increased until a constant rate of product formation is seen. This is shown in the saturation curve on the right. Saturation happens because, as substrate concentration increases, more and more of the free enzyme is converted into the substrate bound ES form. At the maximum reaction rate of the enzyme, all the enzyme active sites are bound to substrate, and the amount of ES complex is the same as the total amount of enzyme. However, VMAX is only one kinetic constant of enzymes. The amount of substrate needed to achieve a given rate of reaction is also important. This is given by the Michaelis Menten constant which is the substrate concentration required for an enzyme to reach one half its maximum reaction rate. Generally, each enzyme has a characteristic Km for a given substrate. Another useful constant is Cat, which is the rate of product formation handled by one active site and is generally given in units of inverse seconds. The efficiency of an enzyme can be expressed in terms of Cat Km. This is also called the specificity constant and incorporates the rate constants for all steps in the reaction up to and including the first irreversible step. Because the specificity constant reflects both affinity and catalytic ability, it is useful for comparing different enzymes against each other, or the same enzyme with different substrates. The theoretical maximum for the specificity constant is called the diffusion limit and is about 108 to 109. At this point every collision of the enzyme with its substrate will result in catalysis, and the rate of product formation is not limited by the reaction rate but by the diffusion rate. Enzymes with this property are called catalytically perfect or kinetically perfect. Example of such enzymes are triose phosphate isomerase, carbonic anhydrase, acetylcholinesterase, catalase, fumarase, I squared lactamase, and superoxide dismutase. Michaelis Menten kinetics relies on the law of mass action, which is derived from the assumptions of free diffusion and thermodynamically driven random collision. However, many biochemical or cellular processes deviate significantly from these conditions, because of macromolecular crowding, phase separation of the enzyme product, or one or two dimensional molecular movement. In these situations, a fractal Michaelis Menten kinetics may be applied. 
some enzymes operate with kinetics, which are faster than diffusion rates, which would seem to be impossible. Several mechanisms have been invoked to explain this phenomenon. Some proteins are believed to accelerate catalysis by drawing their substrate in and pre-orienting them by using dipolar electric fields. Other models invoke a quantum mechanical tunneling explanation, whereby a proton or an electron can tunnel through activation barriers, although for proton tunneling this model remains somewhat controversial. Quantum tunneling for protons has been observed in tryptamine. This suggests that enzyme catalysis may be more accurately characterized as through the barrier rather than the traditional model, which requires substrates to go over a lowered energy barrier. Inhibition Enzyme reaction rates can be decreased by various types of enzyme inhibitors. Competitive inhibition In competitive inhibition, the inhibitor and substrate compete for the enzyme. Often competitive inhibitors strongly resemble the real substrate of the enzyme. For example, methotrexate is a competitive inhibitor of the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase, which catalyzes the reduction of dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. The similarity between the structures of folic acid and this drug are shown in the figure to the right bottom. In some cases, the inhibitor can bind to a site other than the binding site of the usual substrate and exert an allostric effect to change the shape of the usual binding site. For example, Strychnine acts as an allostric inhibitor of the glycine receptor in the mammalian spinal cord and brain stem. Glycine is a major postsynaptic inhibitory neurotransmitter with a specific receptor site. Strychnine binds to an alternate site that reduces the affinity of the glycine receptor for glycine, resulting in convulsions due to lessened inhibition by the glycine. In competitive inhibition the maximal rate of the reaction is not changed but higher substrate concentrations are required to reach a given maximum rate, increasing the apparent Km, uncompetitive inhibition, in uncompetitive inhibition, the inhibitor cannot bind to the free enzyme, only to the ES complex. The EIS complex thus formed is enzymatically inactive. This type of inhibition is rare, but may occur in multimeric enzymes. Non-competitive inhibition Non-competitive inhibitors can bind to the enzyme at the binding site at the same time as the substrate, but not to the active site. Both the EI and EIS complexes are enzymatically inactive. Because the inhibitor cannot be driven from the enzyme by higher substrate concentration, the apparent BMAX changes. But because the substrate can still bind to the enzyme, the KM stays the same. Mixed inhibition, this type of inhibition resembles the non-competitive, except that the EIS complex has residual enzymatic activity. This type of inhibitor does not follow Michaeli's Menten equation. In many organisms, inhibitors may act as part of a feedback mechanism. If an enzyme produces too much of one substance in the organism, that substance may act as an inhibitor for the enzyme at the beginning of the pathway that produces it, causing production of the substance to slow down or stop when there is sufficient amount. This is a form of negative feedback. Enzymes that are subject to this form of regulation are often multimeric and have allostric binding sites for regulatory substances. Their substrate velocity plots are not hyperbolar, but sigmoidal. Irreversible inhibitors react with the enzyme and form a covalent adduct with a protein. The inactivation is irreversible. These compounds include a flornithine, a drug used to treat the parasitic disease sleeping sickness. Penicillin and aspirin also act in this manner. With these drugs, the compound is bound in the active site and the enzyme then converts the inhibitor into an activated form that reacts irreversibly with one or more amino acid residues. Uses of inhibitors Since inhibitors modulate the function of enzymes they are often used as drugs. A common example of an inhibitor that is used as a drug is aspirin which inhibits the COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes that produce the inflammation messenger prostaglandin, thus suppressing pain and inflammation. However, other enzyme inhibitors are poisons. For example, the poison cyanide is an irreversible enzyme inhibitor that combines with the copper and iron in the active site of the enzyme cytochrome C oxidase and blocks cellular respiration. Biological function Enzymes serve a wide variety of functions inside living organisms. They are indispensable for signal transduction and cell regulation, 
often via kinases and phosphatases. They also generate movement, with myosin hydrolyzing ATP to generate muscle contraction and also moving cargo around the cell as part of the cytoskeleton. Other actresses in the cell membrane are ion pumps involved in active transport. Enzymes are also involved in more exotic functions, such as luciferase generating light in fireflies. Viruses can also contain enzymes for infecting cells, such as the HIV integrase and reverse transcriptase, or for viral release from cells, like the influenza virus neuraminidase. An important function of enzymes is in the digestive systems of animals. Enzymes such as amylases and proteases break down large molecules into smaller ones, so they can be absorbed by the intestines. Starch molecules, for example, are too large to be absorbed from the intestine, but enzymes hydrolyze the starch chains into smaller molecules such as maltose and eventually glucose, which can then be absorbed. Different enzymes digest different food substances. In ruminants, which have herbivorous diets, microorganisms in the gut produce another enzyme, cellulase, to break down the cellulose cell walls of plant fiber. Several enzymes can work together in a specific order, creating metabolic pathways. In a metabolic pathway, one enzyme takes the product of another enzyme as a substrate. After the catalytic reaction, the product is then passed on to another enzyme. Sometimes more than one enzyme can catalyze the same reaction in parallel. This can allow more complex regulation, with, for example, a low constant activity provided by one enzyme but an inducible high activity from a second enzyme. Enzymes determine what steps occur in these pathways. Without enzymes, metabolism would neither progress through the same steps nor be fast enough to serve the needs of the cell. Indeed, a metabolic pathway such as glycolysis could not exist independently of enzymes. Glucose, for example, can react directly with ATP to become phosphorylated at one or more of its carbons. In the absence of enzymes, this occurs so slowly as to be insignificant. However, if exokinase is added, these slow reactions continue to take place except that phosphorylation at carbon-6 occurs so rapidly that, if the mixture is tested a short time later, glucose-6 phosphate is found to be the only significant product. As a consequence, the network of metabolic pathways within each cell depends on the set of functional enzymes that are present. Control of activity There are five main ways that enzyme activity is controlled in the cell. Enzyme production can be enhanced or diminished by a cell in response to changes in the cell's environment. This form of gene regulation is called enzyme induction and inhibition. For example, Bacteria may become resistant to antibiotics such as penicillin because enzymes called beta-lactamases are induced that hydrolyze the crucial beta-lactam ring within the penicillin molecule. Another example are enzymes in the liver called cytochrome P450 oxidases, which are important in drug metabolism. Induction or inhibition of these enzymes can cause drug interactions. Enzymes can be compartmentalized with different metabolic pathways occurring in different cellular compartments. For example, fatty acids are synthesized by one set of enzymes in the cytosol, endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus and used by a different set of enzymes as a source of energy in the mitochondrion, through I2 oxidation. Enzymes can be regulated by inhibitors and activators. For example, the end product, S of a metabolic pathway are often inhibitors for one of the first enzymes of the pathway, thus regulating the amount of end product made by the pathways. Such a regulatory mechanism is called a negative feedback mechanism, because the amount of the end product produced is regulated by its own concentration. Negative feedback mechanisms can effectively adjust the rate of synthesis of intermediate metabolites according to the demands of the cells. This helps allocate materials and energy economically, and prevents the manufacture of excess end products. The control of enzymatic action helps to maintain a stable internal environment in living organisms. Enzymes can be regulated through covalent modulation. This can include phosphorylation, myristoylation and glycosylation. For example, in the response to insulin, the phosphorylation of multiple enzymes including glycogen synthase, 
helps control the synthesis or degradation of glycogen and allows the cell to respond to changes in blood sugar. Another example of post-translational modification is the cleavage of the polypeptide chain. Chymotrypsin, a digestive protease, is produced in inactive form as chymotrypsinogen in the pancreas and transported in this form to the duodenum where it is activated. This stops the enzyme from digesting the pancreas or other tissues before it enters the gut. This type of inactive precursor to an enzyme is known as a zymogen. Some enzymes may become activated when localized to a different environment to an oxidizing environment, high pH to low pH, etc. For example, hemagglutinin in the influenza virus is activated by a conformational change caused by the acidic conditions. These occur when it is taken up inside its host cell and enters the lysosome. Involvement in disease Since the tight control of enzyme activity is essential for homeostasis, any malfunction of a single critical enzyme can lead to a genetic disease. The importance of enzymes is shown by the fact that a lethal illness can be caused by the malfunction of just one type of enzyme out of the thousands of types present in our bodies. One example is the most common type of phenylketonuria. A mutation of a single amino acid in the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase, which catalyzes the first step in the degradation of phenylalanine, results in buildup of phenylalanine and related products. This can lead to intellectual disability if the disease is untreated. Another example of enzyme deficiency is pseudocholinesterase, in which the body's ability to break down cholinester drugs is impaired. A further example is when germline mutations in genes coding for DNA repair enzymes cause hereditary cancer syndromes such as xeroderma pigmentosum. Defects in these enzymes cause cancer since the body is less able to repair mutations in the genome. This causes a slow accumulation of mutations and results in the development of many types of cancer in the sufferer. Oral administration of enzymes can be used to treat several diseases. Since enzymes are proteins themselves they are potentially subject to inactivation and digestion in the gastrointestinal environment. Therefore a non-invasive imaging assay was developed to monitor gastrointestinal activity of exogenous enzymes in vivo. Naming conventions, an enzyme's name is often derived from its substrate or the chemical reaction it catalyzes, with the word ending in ace. Examples are lactase, alcohol dehydrogenase and DNA polymerase. This may result in different enzymes, called isozymes, with the same function having the same basic name. Isoenzymes have a different amino acid sequence and might be distinguished by their optimal pH, kinetic properties or immunologically. Isoenzyme and isozyme are homologous proteins. Furthermore, the normal physiological reaction an enzyme catalyzes may not be the same as under artificial conditions. This can result in the same enzyme being identified with two different names. For example, glucose isomerase, which is used industrially to convert glucose into the sweetener fructose, is a xylose isomerase in vivo. The International Union of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology have developed a nomenclature for enzymes, the EC numbers. Each enzyme is described by a sequence of four numbers preceded by EC. The first number broadly classifies the enzyme based on its mechanism. The top level classification is EC1 oxidoreductases, catalyze oxidation reduction reactions, EC2 transferases, transfer of functional group, EC3 hydrolases, catalyze the hydrolysis of various bonds, EC4 lyases, cleave various bonds by means other than hydrolysis and oxidation, EC5 isomerases. Catalyze isomerization changes within a single molecule, EC6 ligases, join two molecules with covalent bonds. According to the naming conventions, enzymes are generally classified into six main family classes and many subfamily classes. Some web servers, for example, EZYPRED and bioinformatics tools have been developed to predict which main family class and subfamily class an enzyme molecule belongs to according to its sequence information alone via the pseudo amino acid composition. Industrial applications Enzymes are used in the chemical industry and other industrial applications when extremely specific catalysts are required. However, 
enzymes in general are limited in the number of reactions they have evolved to catalyze and also by their lack of stability in organic solvents and at high temperatures. As a consequence, protein engineering is an active area of research and involves attempts to create new enzymes with novel properties either through rational design or in vitro evolution. These efforts have begun to be successful, and a few enzymes have now been designed from scratch to catalyze reactions that do not occur in nature. See also References Further reading, external links